way to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only afterward, Jesus was glorified, did they realize what these things, that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I wonder, do you ever ask yourself, why? I mean, I think as you get older, maybe you ask that question less and less. I mean, young people ask it a lot. Why? I mean, there's lots of things that I think, well, why? You know, I, I, I wonder why if you go back 2,000 years, we can look at images of Julius Caesar and people like that that were painted, and yet the king of the world, Jesus, we don't really have a clue what he looked like. Or then this morning when I arrived at church, Steve said to me, he said, why have we got this Bible passage today? He said, uh, Easter's over, isn't it? Well, he's wrong, because it isn't actually. We're still in Easter until we get to about Ascension and then Pentecost. But of course, one of the things is, if you turn up about four weeks after Easter, you've done lots of the post-Easter stories, you know, the Emmaus Road and uh, the, uh, the fishermen coming to the beach with Jesus and Thomas meeting Jesus in that lock room. But one of the dangers with Easter is that I think it all happens so quickly that we don't get the chance to stand back and actually look in more detail at this amazing truth that we find. And of course you might be thinking, why are we doing this story? Well, it's because Paul couldn't be bothered to prepare another sermon. So he's just gone back and used one from four weeks ago. That is not true, as I, as I believe we'll find as we go through this morning. If I was to ask you, in fact, I will ask you, if you were going to describe Jesus, which words would you use? You know, you meet me in the street and I say, you're one of Jesus' followers. Tell me, what's he like? What would you say? Come on, let's, let's hear it. Loving. Compassionate. Caring. Sorry? Kind, yeah. Sorry? Challenging. I like that one, that's good. I mean, I like the others, but I like that one. Gentle. Sorry? Authoritative. It's good to hear ones that we may not have thought of. It's quite interesting that nobody used the word celebrity. Because Jesus certainly was. If you'd had your Bibles, or if you've got your Bibles... Um, or I don't know if we can put the passage back up, but uh, in chapter 12 and verse 12, a nice easy text to remind her, to, to, uh, to find, it says, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, now, if that isn't celebrity, I don't know what is. I mean, Jesus chooses to get on a donkey and ride through the middle of town, ride into town, make a huge entrance. See, it tells us in 
verse 9, that not only had the crowds gone to see Jesus, but they'd also gone to see Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead. I'm sure they're thinking, well, what does someone who's been dead and come back to life look like? Is he going to have bits hanging off him, you know? Who knows? I mean, they're sensible questions. And there's no doubt that the crowds who are there, they're there for the show. They're thinking, what's coming next? And with Jesus, you you don't know what's coming next. I remember talking to a lady who, um, she didn't share the Christian faith. She was from a different faith, but she'd been given a Gospel of Luke to read. She said to me, This Jesus, he goes around like he owns the place. (laughs) And he does, doesn't he? You know, it's true, riding in, everybody coming. Another one of the descriptions that nobody mentioned was humble. I mean, I'm not disputing it. Jesus is humble. It's just that sitting on top of a donkey, entering the city in the same way as kings did, whilst people shout Hosanna and lay their palm leaves. I mean, is that the act of a humble man? Or what about this? His language can be very shocking at times. Turn back a few pages, if you've got your Bibles, to John chapter 8 and verse 12. I think it might appear. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's hardly the kind of phrase you'd expect a humble man to use. And when he follows it up with, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life, it's hard to avoid that slightly awkward shiver of embarrassment. Who does he think he is? We'd prefer it. It would seem less arrogant if... Someone else had said it about Jesus, not him saying about himself. That would be easier to take, wouldn't it, if somebody said, he is the light of the world. But if you go back in your Bibles even further to Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5 and verse 14, that's the way around that it's happening there. Only it produces even more shockwaves. See, these words aren't spoken about Jesus, they're spoken by Jesus. And he turns to his disciples and he says to them, you are the light of the world. Suddenly, I am has become you are. As if there's a connection between the two statements. And uh, if you look in the first verses of chapter 5, Jesus has been teaching his disciple. And he's telling them to not to get a candle for him, but to get a light from him. You see, and it's that second word that makes the whole statement so much difficult for us. You are the light of the world. If only it had been, you could be, or you will be. You should be, or you ought to be. But he says, you are. This isn't a development plan. It's present tense. It doesn't look like there's any plan B either. I mean, you work it through. If that's how Jesus thinks about his disciples, and we are his disciples, it means that Jesus isn't handing the task of being lights to the world to charities or the government or your local authority. He points to communities like you in this church. It's our job to tell people about Jesus. Getting a little tired, I don't know if it's been said in this church, but they quote Francis of Assisi, so they say, Um, The quote is, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I mean, it's a great quote, but 
I've done a bit of research, and I don't actually think that Francis ever said it. I certainly can't find it in any of his writings. And he certainly didn't live it. And more importantly, most importantly, the Bible doesn't teach it. Jesus' final words weren't, go into the world and do good deeds. No, Jesus says, go into the world and preach the good news. Tell others, be salt and light. How are we going to be salt and light in this world, in this community in Ivybridge? Because one thing that is certain is our light isn't going to cut it. No matter how kind, talented, funny, hardworking you are, you won't make a difference. We need to reflect the light of Christ. And we can all nod our heads and shout, Amen. But how's that going to look tomorrow morning? Whether you're at work tomorrow morning or you're with a family or in a coffee shop on the bus, maybe talking to your carers. What will you are the light to the world look like there? With the awkward boss, the difficult husband, the person who's in a rush, the next door neighbor. I mean, maybe when you get together next, I don't know if it'll be for, what was it, wise and wonderful? Wise and wonderful. You might like to think about that. Instead of doing what you're normally going to talk about, maybe in your prayer groups or your house groups, just put it to one side and think, what does you are the light of the world look like for us? It may not be anything dramatic. It just may be small acts of love and kindness. You may feel very feeble in the situation you're in, but just remember that if you were to leave that situation, the light would go out. I love the uh, artwork that James does. I love the way that this church is bathed in a great big bowl of light. And this is a church that you know I, I love and I know that you really do light up the community. But it isn't a bad question, is it? If this church wasn't here next Sunday, if the doors were closed, the lights were out, who would notice? See, and when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking to his disciples, a group of his followers, a church family, if you like. And what he's saying isn't new. It goes back hundreds of years to Isaiah's time. It's in Isaiah 42, verse 6. I didn't give it to Val, so don't expect to see it. Um, But it says this, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. You see, originally God's plan had been for Israel to be a light to the nations. His plan was that Israel would follow him and people would look at them and say, their God is the true God. But because of their sin and the way they turned their back on God, it didn't work. But here the prophet Isaiah is looking forward and he's prophesying into Jesus' time. He's saying... Jesus will be God's light to the nations. And now Jesus is handing this responsibility on to us. We can't reduce it just to individuals, you know. We'll let them talk about Jesus. I'll make the coffee, play the piano, lead the prayers on a Sunday. You are the light of the world means that All of us, this church, and us in our own individual family lives and our work lives need to share with others what it's like to love Jesus. 
Back in Matthew 5, in verse 14, Jesus goes on to say, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a light and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way that your light shine to others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's obvious, isn't it? Jesus is saying that there are times in a Christian's life, in a person's Christian life, where you need to be seen, you need to be visible, you need to be noticed, you need to reflect me. And as you go through the New Testament, you'll see what Jesus is saying is worked out in different ways. By the time we get into the book of Acts, they're acting, they're acting out Jesus' teaching through a community of Christians that we call church. And whether it's this church or every other church in the country, we can't do that if we lock ourselves away inside these wonderful buildings that we have and we don't reach out to people who need forgiveness. How can I be forgiving if I don't allow anyone to come close enough to do me any harm? How do I be long-suffering if I never spend enough time with people to allow them to annoy me. Penn and I go on holiday and we'll be going away soon. Um, and what we like to do is we visit places. I expect you're the same, possibly not so much in this country. But it's always good, you know, if you, even in France, a secular country, wherever you go, there's always some sort of big church and it's great to go into them and have a look around. I look for where the organ is and things like, things like that. Um, most of them are Catholic churches, and so they encourage you to buy and light a candle, to buy a candle which will support lots of the good work that they do. But a light a candle to say a prayer. You won't find lighting candles in the Bible, though. You see, Jesus doesn't call us to light candles. He calls us to be mirrors, to reflect his glorious light. See, the problem is if when we leave church today, we leave the light behind, that's not going to make a difference. We need to burn brightly in the dark world that surrounds us. I mean, I wonder if you, as you drive around and you see churches closing or you hear about churches where the attendance is growing smaller, you ask yourself why? It's something which troubles me quite a lot. You often see churches with people, mainly with people over the age of 60 in them, almost waiting for the last one to survive to turn out the lights. See, Jesus said, you don't light a light and put it under a bowl you put it on the stand and if I look back in the church in my lifetime I think we have been guilty of allowing our churches not to be the stand which we put the light on but to be a bowl which we cover the light up I think if you're a Christian leader there's a real danger that we often say, look at me, don't look at Jesus. One of the things I love, I've never met her, but I see what she puts on Facebook, I, I see some of her sermons, is the way that Amanda reflects Jesus. I mean, I long to meet her, I think it'll be great, I think we'll get on just fine. You should be blessed that you've got her, because... Not everybody does have Christian leaders like that. They feel that if they're attractive, if they make it fun, people will come to church. 
I'll tell you a story. I, I didn't know if we'd have time, but uh, some of you know I play the piano a bit. And uh, a long time ago, um, I was at a big church in Torquay called Upton Vale, and there was somebody that came in to sort of do, do the worship. Uh, and I, it was the best thing that happened to me because he was great. Um, he played the piano that I still want to be able to. Marvellous. And I didn't mind him playing because I, it was a bit like watching James drum, you know. It's just so amazing. You think, how do they do that? And I watched David and he was like this and he did all the jazz, jazz riffs. If, if you hear me play any jazz riffs, they're all nicked from him. It was great. And then it was like something had gone wrong because it wasn't all this sort of stuff. And I said to him, I said, Dave, what, you know, what's going on? I, I love your playing, but it's almost like you're not trying anymore. He said, no, Paul, no, you don't understand. It's not that. He said, it's been troubling me that when I do all this stuff, that I'm the center of attention. That's not what I've been called to do. I've been called to bring the glory to Jesus. I don't want anything to happen that will take away people's worship and from understanding about the Jesus that they're singing about. Some of you know that I take funerals. I've told you about it. And I've said that as I talk to people about Jesus at some of the worst times in their life, that most people actually share the Christian hope that there's more to life than just here and now, and one day they'll be reunited with their friends and the family, those they've loved. I need to apologize, because I was wrong because that is not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is that one day we will be in the presence of Almighty God with Jesus sat at his right hand and everything else won't matter. I've got to be honest with you, I'm struggling with that a bit. I mean... I'm really looking forward to heaven and the praise is going to be wonderful. I was in the Royal Albert Hall last week, 5,000 of us singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. It'll be amazing. I don't know how I'm going to be if I'm not sat beside Penny, if I'm honest with you. Because, you know, it, it, that's the way life is. But athletes don't just rake up to the event, do they, without practicing? They practice for weeks, years, so as they can be the best that they can be. And in our Christian lives, our focus has to be on what Jesus would want it to be, on his Father. See, we're back with the donkey, really. Jesus is saying on that donkey, not look at me. Jesus is saying, look at my father. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey, everybody's shouting Hosanna and laying palm leaves. Jesus is under no illusion about where he will be by Good Friday. He will be high and lifted up with people jeering and spitting and cursing. Do you remember how earlier in a conversation Jesus had spoken with Nicodemus. He said, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light 
for the fear that their deeds will be exposed. Jesus brought light into our world and people didn't want it. Why? Because they'd rather live their lives for now and stuff the consequences. See, Jesus was certainly humble, but he certainly was not naive. See, he knew where he would be. He told Nicodemus, this man that knew his Old Testament really well, and he says to him, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. That's humility. Jesus knew what being high and lifted up meant. Allowing people to hate you, to curse you, to kill you, to rescue those of us that turn to him. If you want to be lights in this world, don't expect to be popular. Don't expect to be popular outside the church or actually sometimes in the church. Jesus' life and death and resurrection was to bring glory to his Father and eternal life for us. Someone once said this, they said it doesn't do to curse the darkness, you need to light a candle. And I guess that's the question for us this morning, isn't it? Are we prepared to be Jesus' candles? Are we prepared to be his mirrors? Not pointing at us, but letting Jesus' light shine on us so it will reflect from us into this dark world that that we can mirror Jesus' light, be part of his rescue plan in this wonderful town of Ivy Bridge. Thank you so much for listening. Let's pray.